Hello, good people. This is Brother Perry again. High Cost of Low Living, Part 2. Well, I wanted to start this piece. Before I start talking about my life, I really just wanted to address something. Somebody approached me when I was in Brooklyn after Part 1, and they said, Hey, man, you seem kind of nervous on that first one. And, you know, on my way back home on my ride, I had to take a look at it because when somebody criticizes me, I like to look at it and learn from it and see what exactly they were talking about. And as I looked at it, you know, it became clear to me. I laughed to myself. For one, you know, I was working for God. Like, I'm working, God is working through me, trying to reach some people and save some lives. So even if you work for a company and the CEO shows up, you want to be on your best behavior and do your best job. You want to impress him. And for God, forget it. It's out of this world. I want to make sure I don't make any mistakes or let Perry come through. I just want God to come through and maybe save somebody's life. The second reason why I was nervous is because I was being rigorously honest about my life. I was being totally open about who and what I am and the way my life developed. You know, no embellishment, no BS. I was just straight up with the honest truth about who I am. I could have hit it from a way of glamorizing it or embellishing my story and telling you about racks and, and the street life and the guns and the all of that and that's that's not what this is all about this is all about maybe saving a life and letting you know that this life the streets and all this caped up to be coat all all it's supposed to be is 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 garbage it's not a pawn shot what you put in you don't get back and um you know before i started i just wanted to clear that up and let you know about myself and about why i was nervous what i'm gonna do now is take you into 1988-89 those were particularly violent years in New York City. And, you know, I can remember, you know, my crew, I had a, a nice crew I rolled with. We all held our own, particularly this day. It was my, my boy Hollywood, my brother Neil, and myself. And we were in front of a pizza shop on Mother Gaston. We used to extort them a little and sell a lot of drugs out of there. At this time, there were a lot of crack in the neighborhoods all across America, and heroin was making a comeback. We used both, and we, we sold both. And, you know, the, on this day, the pizza shop man, because we were blatantly disrespectful for his business, had got upset with us and called the police. And he, he was just tired of our mess. And, you know, we came back maybe a day or two and we let him have it, man. We kind of roughed him up. And I could remember, like clear as day, Hollywood grabbed one of his arms. I grabbed the other arm. My brother Neil opened the pizza oven and we, we shoved the man in head first. And I could remember me saying, I don't remember too much, but I can remember me saying, yeah, man, next time you call the police on us, it's not going to be the only thing cooking in there. It's going to be that ZD. We're going to throw your ass in there, too. And, you know, it was sick, man. It was, it was a sick behavior. But I can remember years later watching Goodfellas, and I seen um, Henry Hill. They, they, he was getting school letters from the mailman, and, and the, the mobsters put the man head first in the oven and said he better not ever get another piece of mail to his house. And... My sixth sense of pride had me laughing uncontrollably at this because I was like, wow, me, Hollywood, and Neil, Brownsville guys thought of something before these great Hollywood producers. I had a sixth sense of pride that we did that first, man, and that was just sad. But looking at my life, I wondered, like, how did I get to this point? And a lot of people wondered that. Anybody who knows me know I come from a very nice family, and, you know, I had very strict parents. I was a little Jehovah Witness boy. And I was basically in the honor classes when I was young. So what turned me, what made me be so incorrigible and become almost a sociopath? What happened in my life? You know, I know a lot of people who were sexually abused or physically abused. This is not my story. And I had to take time out of my life and look back and wonder, where did I go wrong? What happened? And as I looked at it, you know, I remember the self-hate started in my life very early, man. I remember... Like being four and five and six years old, I felt like a beautiful child. I felt like the world was mine. But that turned very quickly. By the time I was seven or eight, I started to hear things, even from family members. And this is not from outside races. This is from people of my own race. They started to say I was too black. My hair was too nappy. I felt so ugly and so messed up and confused. I was like, why couldn't I be light-skinned? Why couldn't I have straight hair? And I remember, man, I remember going in the bathroom. My mother kept a big jar of Noxzema. And I remember putting that Noxzema, so much of it on my face, and scrubbing and scrubbing, thinking I could scrub the black off my face, man. 
And then I remember one time when I really was in tears and I felt so horrible and like I just didn't want to be black anymore. I took a little bit of Ajax. As a matter of fact, I remember it like it was yesterday. It was a green can, so it was common. And I rubbed a little bit on my face, but it was so abrasive. I hurried up and rubbed it off on my pretty black face, man. This is how self-hate set in on my life. As I got older, I learned I had to live with it. So I started to become aggressive. And if you hate yourself, it's so easy to strike out and hurt people that look like yourself. So my self-hate turned into violence and it turned into things against me. And I remember people calling me, hey, fat boy, and this and that, and I would fight. And the next day they would call me big man. So I used the violence and my temperament as a defense mechanism. I even remember, I laugh at it when I think about it today, my hair was like nappy and I didn't like that. And my brother Neil had straight curly hair. And I was like, wow, I love my brother. But I was like, why couldn't my hair be like his? I was wondering about that. And I used to blame God and everybody for my condition. And I thought that I was just not beautiful and I hated myself. And I remember my sister helping me and she used to say, I'm gonna straighten out your hair. And she used to take a straightening iron and run it through my hair and it just looked a mess, it was crazy. But you know, that's where it said in that. That's where the dis-ease started to come into my life. That's where I started to not love myself right at that point. Okay, so it was at this time, when I was about seven or eight or nine years old, that I realized how powerful love was. I had an aunt. She was actually my grandmother's sister because my grandmother lived down south. I didn't see her too often, just a couple of times in my life. But my favorite aunt, Aunt Sarah Hudson, 60 Hall Street, Ocean Hills, Brownsville. We used to go to her house. I, I still flutter when I think about her, the way she made me feel. I felt ugly and black and nappy hair and fat. I felt all that, but this lady made me feel so beautiful. For some reason, out of all my brothers and sisters, she's always singled me out and gave me extra love. I believe God worked through her and she knew I needed that. She made me feel so good. And you know, I just, today I tell people, don't, don't, don't make me unsay you, because if you get too close to me, love is contagious. And where love is, God shows up. And I just always think about her and she made my life just a little bit easier at that time, you know? And um, I'm truly thankful that she was in my life. Yes, good people, I'm getting ready to conclude part two of this series, The High Cost of Low Living by Brother Perry. But I just want you to know that no matter what you are, like white, black, Asian, Latino, you're beautiful, man. You're all God's children. And you know, we have to be so careful of what we say to our young because it impacts them. I don't believe family members or people of my, I don't believe that they meant it negatively, but they labeled me and I, I wore them labels and it hurt my life, man. And it, it led me into a life where I kept doing the same things over and over and not knowing why and expecting different results. People told me that's called insanity. And I want to end with this little joke I heard, and I, I just love it. It shows you how sick insanity is, the things we do. It's about a man who was, who was given a lecture, and he had two ears that were burnt down to a crisp, both his ears. And a young man was in the audience watching him and was like, wow, I wonder what happened to this guy's ears. Look at his ears, what the hell happened to him? And at the end of the lecture, the man told some of his old buddies, he said, look at this young buck looking at me. He probably wants to ask me what happened to my ears, but he's a little too scared. So the guy, the young boy, eased over to the speaker who gave the lecture and said, you know, I, I don't mean to be disrespectful or anything, but I was just wondering, what happened to you? What, what, what happened to your ears? You're such a nice guy and so vibrant and give such a great message. What happened to you? He said, well, I'm gonna tell you a story, man, about insanity. He said, one day I had got my check first of the month. I'm in the house. I'm smoking some crack, doing some dope, drinking liquor, by myself, playing music. And I, I just felt good. And I, I said, let me iron my clothes. So I was ironing my clothes, chilling out in the house, ironing. And the phone rung. Shh. I picked up the phone. The young guy walked away and said, wow, that's crazy. And he walked away and he turned around and he said, but uh, what happened to your other ear? And the man looked at him and said, that motherfucker called me back. Have a good one, good people, and I'll see you on part three. Love is love. Brother Perry signing off.